The president as well. Please be seated. The court is now in session. Nous reprenons l'audience. Mr. Sakovoti is now instructed to report uh, on the attendance of the parties to the proceeding during today's session. Mrs. Sakovoti, Mr. President, the parties to the proceedings today are all present. The President, the security personnel are now instructed to take the accused to the dock. We would like now to give the floor to the International Court Prosecutor to make his final closing statement. You may now proceed. Uh, Mr. President, Your Honours, yesterday we completed our submission on the evidence in relation to the crimes and the jurisdiction of the, of the crimes charged. And in relation to the evidence on the accused's participation in those crimes. To finalise our submission today, we would like to now address you on two areas. First, how the accused participation in the crimes can be legally characterized in terms of the accused individual criminal responsibility under Article 29 of the ECC law. And second, we would like to address your honours on what factors should be taken into account when considering a sentence. Your honours, Given the unplanned breaks uh, yesterday, I believe the prosecution has about an hour and 25 minutes left of their allotted five hours, and I will finish well within that time. Allotted. Briefly, before I commence, I would like to make two corrections to yesterday's submission, or one correction. First, in relation to the evidence of the accused physical mistreatment of detainees at S21, I refer to him beating prisoners with sticks in 1977. Sorry, 1977. I source this incident to the evidence of Lak Min, Chan Pal and Yem En. The evidence referenced, in fact, should just be to Yem En. Which I can refer your honours to at trial day 4th of August 2009, the English transcript at page 119 to 120 and 128. Your honours, the accused is charged in the indictment under Article 29 of the law as a planner, instigator, orderer. Aider and a better and a person who committed the crimes at S21. Put simply, if we bear in mind the accused's role in the establishment of S21, right up till the managing and its final day, the evidence 
clearly establishes les that he undertook all of those forms of participation as identified in the indictment. Dans he had to act in these different ways Il, uh, to commit the crimes due to the fact that he was involved in the establishment of the prison. À la mise en place the de sheer la size of the prison and the staff at S21 and S24, et le de as well as because prison, of the fact of the length of the operation of the longueur, prison la, la durée and the accused hands-on management role. Although this makes common sense, we have detailed the law and applied the facts to it, how his participation fills, fulfills each mode of this liability in our written brief, which we filed two weeks ago with Your Honours, and we refer Your Honours to that for further submissions. Your Honours, the accused is also charged as a superior who failed to prevent or punish his subordinates from committing the crimes. Again, there is no doubt that he had absolute control over his staff at S21 and S24, and that he was well aware that the crimes were occurring and he failed to prevent or punish them. This is obvious, of course, because he wanted his subordinates to commit them. I will now discuss more specifically the accused responsibility for the crimes under the mode of liability called commission. Appelé commission. We have asked you to reflect in your judgment the full scope of the criminals of the accused criminal activity by finding him guilty for his crimes at S21 as part of a joint criminal enterprise. This form of liability, as you are well aware, has been determined by international tribunals to be a form of commission. And why is it important? Simply because, in such a case as this, it more accurately reflects the facts and captures the essence of the accused criminal responsibility. The accused did not act alone, nor could S21 have achieved its horrific efficiency had the entire enterprise not involved the accused planning and working together with his immediate superiors and his immediate subordinates. Your Honours, this was an enterprise of an enormous scale, criminal to its core. The legal recognition of commission of crimes by participation in a criminal plan or enterprise has been a part of international criminal law since the Nuremberg Trials. It has been applicable before both the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, the Special Panel for Serious Crimes in East Timor, the State Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Governor, the Special Court of Sierra, Sierra Leone, whose statutes refer to the same modes of liability as Article 29 of the ECC law. By following the language of these statutes and on this issue, the drafters of the ECC law clearly intended the provision to be interpreted and applied consistently with the law of international tribunals. Applying commission by a joint criminal enterprise to this case is consistent with international criminal standards as practiced before international courts. In fact, given the facts of this case, refusing to apply this mode of liability would place this court at odds with every international criminal court and would amount to an error in the application of the law. The essence of committing a crime via JCE is that individuals in positions of power must be held accountable for the full extent of their criminal responsibility. 
commune et que elle des positions de pouvoir doivent être une responsabilité it comes from the abuse of their power and authority through which they employ others as tools to achieve their criminal objectives de l'abus qu'ils ont fait de leur pouvoir criminal responsibility that arises out of a systemic criminal enterprise is far more serious than the sum of individual criminal orders and individual crimes. The application of JCE, or Joint Criminal Enterprise, in this case, is appropriate because it perfectly captures the scope of the crimes committed by the accused. It also captures the evolution of these crimes and the ways in which the accused developed de la façon and refined the criminal plan over time son plan to identify the enemies and to smash them. De nouveaux ennemis et les the defense liquider. cannot complain about lack of notice on this issue. De ne pas avoir été the co-prosecutors have pleaded the existence of this joint criminal enterprise since its final submission prior to the indictment being issued avant in 2008. When the co-prosecutors appealed the indictment last year, as it did not include the charges of national crime nor the mode of liability of joint criminal enterprise, the accused, in their response, Parce que said such an appeal was not necessary as the prosecution could raise the issue at trial. At the opening of this trial, the co-prosecutors raised the issue of joint criminal enterprise, and it has been thoroughly argued in written briefs before this chamber. We respectfully disagree with the pre-trial chamber's findings on the issue of joint criminal enterprise, and invite your honours to find the accused guilty of the crimes through participation of the joint criminal enterprise, and consequently, because of this notice du fait de sa from 2008, the accused cannot argue that they have accusé ne peut had lack of notice of this mode of liability. Du fait que Your Honours, with regards to the accused's physical, physical commission of crimes, it's limited to a relatively small but significant number of acts. I have referred, Your Honours, both today and in our written briefs to the evidence that clearly proves his personal mistreatment and torture of prisoners when he slapped, beat and kicked them, as well as ordering prisoners to beat each other. Consequently, for these acts, he should be found guilty under the mode of physical commission. We therefore, Your Honours, ask that you find the accused guilty on all counts for committing, planning, instigating and ordering the crimes as well as for failing to prevent or punish his subordinates as a superior. Although the accused's actions would clearly qualify his participation under the form of aiding and abetting the crimes, we submit that this, the other modes of liability better reflect the seriousness of his acts. Que déjà énuméré, rend de mieux et plus for all the reasons du de I have mentioned, pour we wish raisons, to submit donc, that the prosecution has proved beyond reasonable doubt that the accused bears criminal responsibility for the following offences. Crimes, crimes against humanity, namely murder, meurtre, extermination, extermination, enslavement, rape, viol, imprisonment, imprisonment torture, torture, persecutions on political and racial grounds, and other inhumane acts. In relation to grave breaches of the Geneva Convention against the Vietnamese civilians and military prisoners of war, namely willful killing, torture and inhuman treatment, willfully causing great suffering or serious bodily injury, willfully depriving a prisoner of war or civilian the rights of a fair and regular trial, an unlawful confinement to a civilian, and torture and homicide contrary to the Cambodian 
et détention illégale de civils et enfin torture et homicide en violation du Code pénal cambodgien de 1975. Prescribed under the ECCC law, five years to life imprisonment. This law, the agreement, and the internal rules do not provide any additional assistance. Therefore, this chamber is bound to examine the sentencing principles found in other international criminal tribunals dealing with similar crimes. I will now deal with each principle in turn. It's widely accepted that the most important consideration in determining a sentence is the gravity or the seriousness of the crime. The sentence must reflect the inherent gravity or totality of the criminal conduct of the accused. Gravity of the crime is therefore the starting point for the Chamber's deliberations upon the appropriate sentencing range. Under international jurisprudence, the gravity of a crime is to be assessed by considering at least three factors. One, the nature of the crimes and the means by which they are committed. Two, the extent of impact upon the victim. And three, the degree of participation of the accused. I will now examine these factors separately. Regarding the nature of the crimes and the means by which they were committed, there is no doubt that the crimes at S21 were of the utmost gravity both in number and type. More than 12,000 human lives were destroyed. A large percentage of these victims were brutally tortured. All suffered unspeakable conditions. Most significantly, these crimes were not a collection of individual random acts of brutality that occurred sporadically or without design. They occurred daily, systematically and deliberately within the 41-month life of the prisoner. These acts are heinous and shocking. Now, regarding the impact of the crimes on the victims and witnesses, Particular consideration is given to the long-term physical and psychological effects suffered. This impact, impact extends to the family and friends of the victims as well as the wider community. As we know, for a prisoner, S21 was a place of no return. Only a handful survived. Three survivors who testified are permanently scarred mentally and physically from their imprisonment and mistreatment. These men testified in graphic detail of their suffering, which has caused them, which has caused them to endure it to this very day. They have suffered emotional instability, anguish, anxiety, nightmares, knowing their survival survivors but pure chance. For the victims of S21 who did not survive, a network of traumatized family members and friends extends across not only Cambodia but across the entire world. Civil parties have testified how the member of the murder of their loved ones has ripped their families apart. Evidence has been heard that such suffering has led them or some family members to commit suicide as the only way to deal with their grief. The number of these relatives and friends directly affected by the loss Le nombre de ses proches et amis directement par la perte de leur parents est inconnu, mais on peut très certainement en estimer le nombre. It also should not be forgotten that there were many lower-ranking staff members of S21, most from poor peasant backgrounds, who were forced to participate in the crimes against their will. These staff recruited by the accused will suffer today 
ils ont payé les acteurs et recrutés par l'accusé. Aujourd'hui encore, ils souffrent de ce qu'ils ont vu et de ce qu'on aura ordonné de faire. Manifestement, le coût et la conséquence des crimes commis à S21 est encore ressenti à ce jour par la collectivité tout entière. Ainsi, Dr. Chim Sotiara est venu ici nous dire longuement comment les stress, le symptôme de stress post-traumatique affectait les victimes des crimes commis par le PCK. Les crimes commis à S21 s'inscrivent dans le cadre de ces crimes et qui ont laissé derrière le traumatisme, la violence, la dépression, la séparation et la destruction de l'identité familiale, culturelle et sociétale. Your Honours, the extent of the accused's participation must also be considered in determining the sentence. Under international criminal law, cases often fall into two categories: one, where the accused inflicts pain and suffering upon the victim with his own hands, and two, where the accused, because of his superior position, was able to inflict his pain and suffering through others. When an accused is both a superior and an active participant in the crimes, he becomes more culpable. Similarly, where an accused displays enthusiasm while he participates in the crime, the crime is viewed as more serious. The same is true when the accused commits the crime voluntarily, willingly, knowingly, and with premeditation. En connaissance de As we've explained earlier, the accused voluntarily joined and stayed with the CPK in full knowledge of the violence le with which he sought to achieve the same. Over the course of his involvement, he worked his way up the CPK hierarchy, becoming a highly reliable and trusted security expert, working in close cooperation with the very highest leaders of the party. In committing these crimes, crimes, the accused exhibited a great zeal and enthusiasm. He was a committed teacher who relished transforming individuals into torturers and killers. He was a perfectionist who took pleasure in assuring the proper administration of S21, whether it be by choosing locations training staff, devising questions, ordering interrogation and torture techniques. In his role as chairman, the accused was significantly responsible for the widening, widening net of torture, terror and suffering in Cambodia. Because of his analysis of confessions and subsequent recommendations, thousands were arrested, tortured and ultimately executed. Within S21, he ordered his subordinate to interrogate and kill. By his own admission, he toured interrogation cells. He personally kicked and hit prisoners and caused prisoners to beat each other. His faith in the CPK was unqualified. It allowed him to remain absolutely committed to his role in the system and indifferent to the suffering of the victims or their pleas for mercy. Taken as a whole, his extensive participation in the crimes made him one of the most effective tools in the CPK's policy of seeking out, arresting and killing its perceived enemies. The crimes committed by the accused at S21 are rarely matched in modern history in terms of their combined barbarity, scope, ont peu de d'équivalent dans l'histoire moderne pour ce qui est de leur barbarie, de leur portée, de leur durée, de leur prémédication et de leur caractère Et j'en arrive maintenant aux circonstances de l'accusé comme facteur à prendre compte dans la définition de la peine. Il faut retenir ici l'âge qu'il avait et son degré d'instruction à l'époque où il a rejoint S21. Au contraire de la plupart des employés qui ont été membres, l'accusé était une personne très instruite and exceptionally logical. It is clear that he had the ability to move towards the CPK or away from it, and he made his choice. When he started at S21, in his early 30s, he was not naive and impressionable like most of the staff who personally employed and indoctrinated. Having spent four years as the chairman of M13, he knew what was expected of him. 
Although perhaps less sophisticated in its operations than S21, M13 had the same purpose and method of operation. Its goal was to arrest, detain, interrogate, torture and execute CPK's enemies. From his experience, the accused was, just, was not just well versed in the ordering of interrogation, torture and killing, he had personally tortured many times himself. Therefore, from the moment he was asked to establish S21, his second interrogation, torture and killing centre, the accused understood the exact nature of the undertaking and he was ready and willing to accept it. The fact that he was an intelligent man who had undergone extensive education when he made his free choice is a relevant matter that the Chamber should consider ce choix en toute liberté est un, une question pertinente que la Chambre doit, se doit de Having dealt with the gravity of the offence, degree of the accused's participation and his circumstances, I will now turn to factors that international criminal courts consider as aggravating in the consideration of an appropriate sentence. Three particular recognized aggravating factors are relevant in this case. First, the accused abuse of power. Second, the particular cruelty inflicted. And third, the defenselessness of the victims. Abuse of power. Although the mere fact that an accused holds a position of authority is not an aggravating factor, the manner in which that authority is exercised may be. The accused, as a prison warden, had legal and moral obligations to protect the rights of its detainees. Yet, in reality, he presided over a systematic mistreatment, torture and murder of those under his care. At no point during his chairmanship could it be said that he had any intention or felt any duty to protect the welfare of the prisoners. The accused did and thought the exact opposite. The purpose of his role was not to protect but in fact to degrade, protéger, torture and kill those who otherwise tuer, should have expected his protection. Dû être par lui. Second, turning to the cruelty, Deuxième the particular point, cruelty cruauté, for which the crimes were committed, avec les international jurisprudence holds that the infliction of unusual pain and suffering should be seen as aggravating in sentences. Such pain and suffering must go beyond the normal commission of the crime and display a particular, particularly savage, sadistic or ruthless quality. And cruelty can be either considered to be psychological or physical. The catalogue of brutality employed by guards and interrogators at S21 was truly grotesque. The prisoners were subjected to savage beatings which left them with bloody exposed wounds. Their toenails and fingernails were ripped out with pliers. They were humiliated and forced to pay homage to images of dogs and to physical objects. Some prisoners were electrocuted to the point of unconsciousness Others were nearly drowned. Particularly cruel was the force feeding of excrement. Prisoners also suffered the horrors of being surgically operated on whilst alive and having their blood drawn, resulting in a slow, agonizing death. The brutality of S21 was particularly unbearable psychologically. The terror, shock, fear and utter confusion endured by the prisoners beyond our imagination. These prisoners were held in cells, aware of the torture and suffering that surrounded them, seeing wounds and moans of the victims that foreshadowed their own fate. The degrading and humiliating insanitary conditions in the cells made many prisoners fall sick 
conditions insanitaires ou Some prisoners died in these conditions. Their corpses often remaining in the communal leg irons for hours or at times overnight before they were taken away. Aux côtés des prisonniers vivants pendant des Imagine heures et parfois toute une nuit avant que les cadavres ne soient enlevés. Imaginez ce qu'avaient senti chaque prisonnier, prisonnier allongé avec les fers au pied, en attendant de voir quand est-ce que leur nom serait appelé. Il n'est pas étonnant que des prisonniers aient été essayés de se tenter de se suicider ou se suicider ou se suicider. Car ils pensaient que la fin de leur vie était plus difficile. Car il pensait Again, from this distance, we cannot even begin to understand the extreme psychological effects of being subjected to multiple interrogation and torture sessions with the savage violence these prisoners endured. The final act of cruelty committed against each prisoner came at Tung Ek. Blindfolded and handcuffed, the prisoners were forced to kneel down in the dark next to their own burial pits. There they waited until the blow of a shovel or cart axle broke the back of their heads. And if that did not kill them, their throats were slit before they were kicked into their grave. Your Honours, the third and final factor we submit for consideration as an aggravating factor relates to the particular defencelessness of the victims. These prisoners had no protection, starved, shackled, tortured, with no ability to defend themselves, they were helpless. Your Honours, we submit that in this case, all three aggravating factors, abuse of power, particular cruelty in the crimes and the defencelessness of the victims are directly relevant and must be taken into account in determining the accused sentence. La peine de Your Honours, just as you should take into Monsieur account the aggravating juge, factors when determining your sentence, you should also take into account any peine, mitigating factors that may be present. The defence may argue that the accused committed his crimes la under duress and because he was acting under superior orders. A, um, In addition, they may request that you take into account his cooperation, his de, plus, de facto guilty plea, de sa remorse, de and the consequent effect de these factors may have on national reconciliation euh, in Cambodia. I will first discuss duress. As we've, as we've explained at length, the accused claims he hated his work and committed these crimes under duress out of fear that he would be killed if he disobeyed his orders. And as I stated earlier, the evidence does not support this interpretation of the facts. The, asset, the, the assertion the accused was both a hostage and a prisoner of the CPK even at an early stage of his involvement, in, of his involvement in the criminal activities is contradicted by recollections from Francois Bizot, his prisoner and confidant at M13. Bizot writes, terror from that moment became all-powerful. It seduced him by putting on the face of morality and order. Bizo did not see a man in terror, but rather a man of terror. The accused assertion that he was in fear throughout S21's operations is contradicted by his own statements to the investigating judges. He told them, and I quote, I was particularly affected after seeing the mass arrest of Kadra from the northern zone on the 31st of January 1977 because I felt a lot of sympathy for them. I was terrified. And after the arrest of Nyet Yu alias Hong, on the 13th of March 1978, and Vaughan Vet on the 2nd of November 1978, I began to fear for my life. Therefore, in his own words, 
He began to fear for his life in 1978. This is likely to be closer to the truth and conforms with the analysis of Dr. Chandler. In arguing their claim of QRS, the defense contend that the fear which motivated the accused emanated from a climate of terror that gripped Democratic Campuchia. The existence of such a claim is undoubtedly true and has been established by both witness and expert testimonies at trial. That is, the existence of a climate of terror. But what the defense have not established is that the accused was subject to that terror. In fact, the evidence demonstrates that he was unaffected. It demonstrates that he was not a victim of terror, but its cause. The accused, as protector of the CPK party center, was entrusted with intelligence gathering and state security. His position all made, also made him in the words of Elizabeth Becker, one of the half dozen most important leaders in the country. Taken together, the evidence does not show a fearful man. To the contrary, it demonstrates a confident man who spreads terror across Cambodia through his work at S21. A man who was irreplaceable in his position. It's well recognized that totalitarian regimes that maintain control through terror, that they do maintain control through terror. It's also accepted that these terror systems often turn on their creators. As the philosopher and Holocaust survivor Hannah Arendt states, Terror turns not only against its enemies, but against its friends and supporters as well. The climax of terror is reached when the police state begins to devour its own children, when yesterday's executioner becomes today's victim. Given the all-consuming terror that, that existed in democratic Kampuchea, it's not surprising that the accused and the other senior leaders eventually felt fear. It would be far more surprising if they didn't. Ultimately, the fact that the accused may have felt fear in 1978 does not overshadow the fact that he freely and willingly designed a system of terror or that he was once an enthusiastic and willing participant in these crimes. Your Honours, the accused should not be able to hide behind the effects of the terror that he in fact created. Furthermore, he cannot be credited for fear, he says, he may have felt in 1978 when the vast majority of the crimes had already been committed. The presence of duress is closely linked to the mitigating factor of committing crimes pursuant to superior orders. Under Article 29, it leaves open the possibility that acting pursuant to a superior order at the discretion of this court may mitigate punishment, although the presence of them cannot be a basis to extinguish criminal responsibility. Under international criminal law, a subordinate attempting to rely upon a superior's orders as a mitigating circumstance must show that the orders had an influence on his or her behavior. If the subordinate was already prepared to carry out the criminal conduct, no such mitigating circumstance can be said to exist. This, Your, Your Honours, we submit, is a situation in the case of the accused. As we've already showed, it was the accused's own desire to advance the revolution and smash its enemies, and not his superior's specific orders, which caused him to participate in the crimes in the way he did. He believed in the validity of the orders and, in fact, supplied recommendations which, in many cases, led to those orders 
being issued. For these reasons, we submit that the mitigating circumstances of both duress and superior orders do not apply in this case. I will now turn to four other interrelated mitigating circumstances that you may be requested by the accused to take into account in determining his sentence. These four are cooperation, guilty plea, remorse and the consequent effect these factors may have on national reconciliation in Cambodia. International jurisprudence clearly recognises that the accused cooperation with a prosecutor is a mitigating factor to be taken into account in sentencing. Actual credit depends on the quality and quantity of the information provided and whether it was given voluntarily and selflessly without asking for anything in return. When cooperation makes the trial more efficient, substantial credit can be given. Consequently, early cooperation in the process will have a greater value. An accused can also cooperate by testifying against others in the subsequent trial. The information by the accused must strengthen known facts and therefore save resources during trial or the investigation. If the information provided is limited or if it is not wholly true, the giving of that information is insufficient mitigation. Your Honours, I will suggest that in this case, the easiest way to assess the accused's cooperation is by looking at his actions prior to his arrest and through to his investigation and trial. After the accused committed his crimes at S21, he made a choice not to surrender himself to the authorities. In fact, he missed every opportunity to do so from 1979 until his discovery and arrest in 1999. For 20 years, he lived as a fugitive for the first 15 with the former senior leaders of the CPK. The accused and his work colleagues testified that in the 1990s he concealed his past by changing his name and not revealing his role as chief torturer and executioner of S21. He said he changed his name particularly to avoid being located by investigative journalists. This, of course, would have jeopardized his freedom. One of those investigative journalists, Nick Dunlop, tracked him down in 1999 and that ultimately led to his arrest. It was only after he was confronted by Dunlop with evidence of his involvement in S21 that the accused considered, considered it impossible to deny the truth. He also made it clear in these proceedings that had he not been found by Dunlop, it was unlikely he would be on trial. He stated that everything was compromised when Nick Dunlop Found me. From the 2nd of September, page 55 and 56. Years after his arrest, it appeared that the perseverance of Dunlop infuriated the accused. Whilst the accused was in custody, Dunlop records in his book asking his lawyer, Mr. Carr Savut, how the accused felt about being arrested when so many others were walking free. Mr. Carr told him that the accused was angry, saying it was because of you that he was put in jail. However, Your Honours, while in custody and over time, after receiving legal advice, the accused has come to accept that he does bear individual responsibility for the crime of S21, that he cannot just blame the policies of the senior CPK leaders for his actions. 
L'accusé a commencé à accepter qu'il a une responsabilité individuelle pour les crimes de prosecution et qu'il ne peut pas se contenter de blâmer les policiers du dirigeants du PCK pour s'être rendu compte de cela. Il a commencé à fournir des éléments de preuve aux juges et aux procureurs sur la façon dont fonctionnait S21, la structure et les politiques du PCK, la mise en œuvre des politiques criminelles pendant la période du Compoutio démocratique et les informations sur les autres participants dans les politiques criminelles. Mais ça dit, avec regard à ses propres responsabilités, as we have submitted, he has only admitted part of the truth. Despite accepting general overall responsibility for the crimes, he is in effect telling the court, I did terrible things, but it's not really my fault. It's the fault of my superiors. It should also be recalled that he has mostly admitted crimes that are undoubtedly established by the documentary evidence and not more. Your Honours, the accused lack of cooperation with the court in deciding to only admit a limited responsibility for the crimes to minimise the sentence is further demonstrated in the defence strategy at trial. The defence have continually tried to limit the scope of the evidence and the, the ability of this trial chamber to review the relevant facts of this case. This has been done through a number of legal challenges. If you look at the cumulative effect of these challenges, it's clear that they've been designed to reduce the impact of the crimes and his personal responsibility. I will briefly outline some aspects of this strategy. First, at the outset of this case, in their opening, the defence were effectively asking you to find that there was little evidence to support the personal jurisdiction requirement necessary to prosecute the accused, uh, arguing on the one hand that this jurisdictional element is not made out, and yet on the other hand stating that the accused has been completely cooperative with the court, and yet still trying to undermine the case against him. I'm referring to the jurisdictional requirement that the accused was either a senior leader or most responsible for the crimes in Democratic Campuchia. Second, the defence's objection to the admission of any evidence or testimony concerning the accused's prior conduct and prior behaviour occurring for four years at the M13 Security Centre was clearly designed to reduce the ability of this trial chamber to determine his motive and intent for committing the crimes at S21. By trying to restrict Your Honours from hearing this evidence, Your Honours would have had less ability to determine the address, to determine, to address the key issue in this case as the accused, as the accused willingness to commit the crimes S21. They did not want you to take into account the fact that he was an experienced, hardened torturer and killer well before arriving at S21. Yet the defence were more than happy for Your Honours to hear of his good character in his early years as a student and teacher before arriving at S21. Third, the defence objection to the submission by the prosecution of detailed witness summaries of every key witness statement in this case to the trial chamber was clearly motivated to ensure that the impact of the crimes and the role of the accused was less easily discovered. The practice of provide, providing comprehensive summaries of large amounts of evidence, particularly witness statements, is common at other international criminal courts. This is to ensure the focus is kept on the key issues so that all parties, including the Chamber, do not become lost in a sea of evidence. 
In effect, these tools are a roadmap to assist the trial chamber and the parties to understand the key issues of the case more quickly. The purpose of the objections was clear. Less clarity in the case would lead to less clarity as to the role of the accused and the impact of the crimes. Fourth, the defence clearly attempted to inhibit the flow of evidence to, the, to this chamber by objecting to a proposed reserve witness list. A reserve witness list was put forward by the prosecutors to fill potential evidentiary gaps that may have been left if the scheduled witnesses suffered memory loss or were reluctant to tell the truth. Due to the fact that the parties were not able to assess the reliability of a witness by meeting them prior to the trial, it submitted that the reserve list proposal was reasonable. In this case particularly, there was a reasonable risk to take to take into account, bearing in mind most witnesses who survived with the staff at S21. To put it mildly, it was reasonable to expect that these witnesses would have been less than enthusiastic about testifying due to feelings of personal guilt and embarrassment of having participated in the crimes at S21. With the first S21 staff witness, these predictions proved to be true. As these witnesses continued to come, it was evident that there was a general reluctance by most of them to talk freely, especially in public and in the presence of their former chief. Luckily, most of them gave prior statements in the judicial investigation allowing them, at, at the least, to be firmly guided back Nous to a truer account dans la of events. Fifth, and unfortunately for this case, defence decided to energetically take over the court's role of advising the first S21 interrogator witness that if he testified, it was quite possible he would be prosecuted for crimes he may have committed at S21 in the national courts. Despite the fact that this possibility on any account was less than remote, the effect of raising that fear by the defence in the manner that it did, in the mind of the first S21 witness, sent a message through the media to all the remaining S21 witnesses that testifying was a risky business. These early warnings, beyond the defence's mandate, done in public, based on dubious legal reasoning, no doubt put fear into every S21 witness into fully disclosing what they knew about the crimes and the accused role at S21. We can only speculate what effect these unsolicited warnings had on the witnesses, but we can certainly say the warnings of the defence did not encourage the witnesses to tell the truth. Amazingly, when witness, witnesses like Ma'am Nye clearly did not tell the truth, the defence appeared to take great satisfaction about such failure. Here's an actual quote from the defence counsel. Mr. Prosecutor, la défense I'd like to thank you. If you have any other witnesses like this one, échec, please do not hesitate to call them. Une citation de la défense, this remark by the defence was particularly disturbing, disturbing bearing in mind Ma'am Nye was the very witness they warned of the dangers of testifying in this court. Your Honours, the accused in the defence may submit to this court. We are cooperating and want to admit full responsibility and have told the truth about S21 to assist in this country's reconciliation process. It's difficult to see how taking such great satisfaction from witnesses not telling the truth in this assist that process. Finally, the defence have also attempted to limit the flow of documentary evidence to the chamber, which would otherwise assist in resolving the factual issues in this case. 
for example, enfin, la the documents supporting Craig Edgerton's expert de, report, de preuve, the armed um, conflict chambre, documents, uh, and documents containing annotations of the accused handwriting were all challenged by the defence on the basis that they were unnecessary and repetitive. This led to time-consuming and unnecessary arguments before the Chamber about the relevance and probative value of such documents. So, Your Honours, to sum up, what is the overall effect of the accused cooperation with this court? It should be judged at two levels. At one level, he has cooperated by providing evidence that has given the court a better understanding of the CPK regime, its criminal policies, its structure and communication methods, as well as the inner workings of S21. At the same time, he has assisted in providing valuable information which will assist the prosecution of other suspects. Therefore, he has provided valuable information to the prosecution. However, at another level, he has been uncooperative niveau, and not truthful about his role well at S21. He has sought to shift responsibility for his crimes elsewhere, crime and, and in a number of cases where he has given truthful answers, answers where he he was he was largely because he found it difficult to maintain the relationship with the court. 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 As I've illustrated, through his defence, the accused has been less than cooperative by attempting to limit the evidence flow and clarity of the evidence so as to reduce his chamber's ability to understand the full gravity and impact of the crimes and the accused's role in them. Of course, these challenges and objections are within their rights. However, you cannot heavily challenge the trial process at every stage and then claim at the end that you are cooperating. I will now move to two interrelated mitigating factors, the entry of a guilty plea and an expression of remorse. Both of these acts require a level of sincerity and honesty on the part of the accused. Although there is no concept of guilty plea under ECC and Cambodian law, your honours are required required to evaluate the accused's admissions when considering the appropriate sentence. Full admissions of responsibility and unequivocal guilty pleas can be particularly beneficial for victims and play an important role in reconciliation and establishment of a historical record. I will not repeat our arguments about the fact that the accused has not been truthful about his willing role in carrying out the crimes at S21. De la but we'll simply ask your honours to take them into account. La, uh, no one should make the mistake of believing that this case is equal to an unqualified guilty plea before an international tribunal. It should be recalled that significant differences remain between the prosecution and the defence in relation to the issue of the accused's voluntary and active involvement in the crimes. We acknowledge that as these proceedings have continued, the accused has appeared to make more concessions about this role. This was also the case with the investigating judges. We accept that even this qualified exception acceptance of responsibility may have helped some of the victim's families corroborated the available evidence and facilitated to some extent the shortening of this first trial. And yet it should be recalled that whenever pressed on his own involvement, the accused has been consistently recalcitrant and, in our view, dishonest. As an example, I would refer your honours to Judge Cartwright's question in the accused on the issue of his character in the final stages of the trial. Despite her honour putting to him evidence which showed that his behaviour at S21 far exceeded that of someone who acted Madame, under threat uh, or otherwise unwillingly, he failed to make one concession. This was the accused's opportunity to speak candidly and openly to the chamber, and he abandoned it. What are we left with? 
Essentially, the accused claimed that he was forced to torture and kill against his will, unless, of course, he now chooses to take us up on the offer we made earlier and confirms the brief statement he made when questioned by his counsel. The accused must accept the reality that unless he faces up to the truth and admits that he committed his crimes as a devoted man with the enthusiasm and zeal of an ardent revolutionary, he has not accepted full responsibility for the crimes in this court. Your Honours, as with admissions of guilt, the trial chamber must evaluate whether an expression of remorse is genuine. It is fair to observe that the accused's expressions of remorse have been numerous. Yet that remorse is clearly limited by the considerations of denial of responsibility to which I have just referred. The evidence from the psychologist is that the accused has an inability to empathise. But the psychologists have also said, in effect, he is a pragmatist. They suggested that his conversion to Christianity, that he converted to Christianity because he took the view that communism was a spent Force. To the extent that the accused has expressed remorse openly in these public proceedings, it is a relevant consideration for this chamber. However, in light of his failing to admit his full responsibility in the crimes and his limited ability to empathise with the victims, this consideration should be limited. Finally, the defence have argued that the accused enfin, cooperation and remorse will contribute to national reconciliation and that that will be best achieved by a sizable reduction in his sentence. In our view, well, while national reconciliation is a legitimate consideration for this court, the accused's behaviour has not added significantly to it. The central purpose of this trial is to ascertain the truth, impose a just and proportionate sentence and end impunity. To the extent that that process will contribute to national reconciliation, we submit that a heavily reduced sentence will in fact hamper and not help the attainment of national reconciliation in Cambodia. The first must be said that national reconciliation is a byproduct of the criminal trial, not its purpose. As much as the defence would prefer a truth and reconciliation process that simply lays out the facts, Cambodia and the international community chose instead a court of law that applies imprisonment as punishment if convictions are found. It should be recalled that before this trial, he opted to stay with the Khmer Rouge until only a few years before his arrest. His current qualified cooperation, admissions and remorse, while helpful, confirming that the Khmer Rouge committed international crimes, cannot claim to have any discernible impact on peace in Cambodia or in the minds of the victims. More significantly, the defence have failed to show how a lighter sentence would have any effect on national reconciliation. For example, would there be public disapproval and unrest were the accused to receive a sentence of long-term imprisonment? Our understanding of the facts and sentiments in the Cambodian community is quite the contrary. We believe that to take the first step in righting the wrongs of S21, humanity must be made whole by sternly punishing one of its own for ignoring it so gravely. Doing so will far more, do far more for humanity and even the accused humanity than giving into a misguided notion that a disproportionately low sentence somehow facilitates reconciliation. Your Honours, the, the next factor I will turn to in favour of the accused in the time is the time that he has previously spent 
previously spent awaiting trial in custody. This chamber has already ruled that, upon conviction, he is entitled to credit for time served in detention of the ECC since the 31st of July 2007, and for the eight years, two months and 20 days, he was detained under the orders of the Cambodian military court prior to his transfer to the ECC. Your Honours have also ruled that the accused is entitled to an additional remedy to compensate him for the serious violation of his rights in being, in being detained contrary to applicable law. The case law of other international tribunals suggests that such a remedy would require a specific reduction in sentence. The ICTR cases of Baraguiza and Calielli are particularly relevant. In these two cases, the accused received reductions of their sentence of life imprisonment to sentences of 35 and 45 years, respectively, due to the violation of their rights in being unlawfully detained. The co-prosecutors recognise that the violations of the accused rights in this case are more serious than in either of those two cases. The maximum length of the pre-trial detention under Cambodian law for the offences with which the accused was charged is three years. It follows that at least the additional five years, two months and 20 days of his pre-trial detention by the military court were unlawful. The chamber has pointed out other irregularities in the accused detention by the military court, including a failure on the part of the authorities to carry out a substantial and systematic investigation into the allegations against him. Here, before the ECCC, as before Every properly constituted court in the world, the rule of law must be applied. The principles of fair trial and due process must be applied. Therefore, when an accused is not brought to trial within a reasonable period of time or is held in pre-trial detention without proper justification, such violations must be remedied. And because the violations of the accused rights so substantial, the only reasonable response is to grant a remedy that would affect the ultimate serve, ultimate sentence he must serve for these crimes. In a case such as this, Given the gravity of the crimes and the extensive aggravating circumstances, the starting point for considering a sentence must be life imprisonment. However, the clear principles established by international jurisprudence require the trial chamber to take this breach into account. The co-prosecutors submit co that the fair and appropriate uh, course for the trial chamber would be to commute the sentence of life, which would otherwise have been imposed to a determinate sentence. Such reduction to be an express and measurable remedy for the breach of the accused rights. And this leads me to my conclusion. Voilà qui à ma conclusion. Let's recall that unlike his prisoners at S21, to whom this accused denied even the slightest shred of humanity, he has been met with open and even-handed justice in this court. He has received a fair trial in accordance with the law and a bench independent and impartial judges. If convicted, he will be sentenced to a punishment proportionate to those crimes. Although he belonged to one of the most murderous and barbarous regimes in the history of mankind, he will be sentenced only for the crimes he committed.
S21 prisoners never received such treatment. They were falsely accused and arbitrarily punished. No counsel argued their case, no opportunity to affront, to confront their accusers at a public trial, no ability to challenge the verdict and sentence in a higher court. On the contrary, the accused ensured they were treated as animals. To him, they were enemies of the state who deserved no mercy and no compassion. Of course, Your Honours, nothing can justify the brutality and humanity at S21. And yet this accused clearly believed the unthinkable acts perpetrated on the victims were not only justified but necessary. Nothing short that misguided belief throughout the years during which he engineered, perfected and meticulously managed the CPK's most effective killing machine. As we've illustrated, he worked tirelessly to identify, arrest and smash perceived He created the very multiplier effect which spread the web of S21 throughout Cambodia. The accused repeated apologies and his tears were strung out. When confronted with the skulls of thousands of his victims, will be held up to your honours as evidence of his contrition. We do acknowledge that he has admitted the majority of the underlying crimes at S21 and his responsibility as chairman. And yet you must view his alleged remorse in the context of his continued refusal to admit his active and enthusiastic participation in the crimes. Clearly, Your Honours, any denial of the base crimes at S21 would have been futile in the face of the physical, testimonial and expert evidence before the court. But wherever possible, the accused is adamantly sought to minimise his role. He accepts responsibility only on his own terms, where he attempts to paint a picture of himself as an unwilling willing participant caught up in a machine he could not escape, trapped by secrecy and terror. You must not allow him to hide behind these false claims. You must recall that he was not a victim of his system, but its loyal and dedicated agent. Mr. President, Allow me to refer to a quote which encapsulates the dilemma that human dignity would have put before the accused when he perpetrated these crimes. William Shawcross, the leading British prosecutor at the Nuremberg War Crimes Trial, said, there comes a point when a man must refuse to answer to his leader if he is also to answer to his own conscience. Your Honours, in committing these crimes, the accused abandoned his conscience. In fact, he abandoned every duty we, as human beings, owe to one another. The primary focus of this trial must be the gravity of the crimes, their impact on the victims, and the accused role in the infliction of that suffering. The sentence must therefore properly reflect the, the destruction the accused perpetrated so willingly and enthusiastically. It must reflect his conscious and free choice to, to abandon all respect for human life, life and his choice of abuse of power over conscience. In ordinary circumstances, in case of conviction, the only appropriate punishment for the accused would be a life sentence of imprisonment. In this case, however, specific factors warrant a reduction from life imprisonment to a fixed number of years. First, we submit that the conversion of a life sentence to 45 years would provide an express 
measurable and appropriate remedy for the accused prior unlawful detention. Explicite, mesurable, and appropriate. Second, we ask that a further reduction of five years be granted for his general cooperation, limited acceptance of responsibility, his conditional remorse, and the possible effect it may have on national reconciliation. We submit, therefore, that the Nous, sentence euh, to be opposed by this trial chamber should be 40 years in prison. Your Honours, we ask Madame you to remember the, the stories of the thousands of those victims who suffered at S21. Your Honours should be mindful of the dreams and opportunities that were denied. Also keep in mind the S21's unrelenting brutality that was meted out with no mercy to all prisoners, including hundreds of children, the most defenseless of victims. Finally, bear in mind the loss and suffering of the families of those victims who are still suffering to this very day. Not just the victims and their families, but the whole of humanity demands a just and proportionate response to these crimes. And this court must speak on behalf of that humanity. It must punish the accused justly and send a clear message that crimes like these must never be perpetrated again. Cambodians have come to this court from their towns and villages from around the country. Many have come from overseas and millions of others are watching intently on TV. They are waiting for a justice that tells us our humanity will be protected. They are waiting for a justice that tells them and tells those distant voices from S21 that this justice was done in their name, every single one of them. Mr. President, Your Honours, let your judgment speak for justice in finding this accused guilty and imposing the sentence we have recommended, a sentence which reflects criminal responsibility for more than 12,000 crimes. Au vu de plus de 12 crimes in imposing this penalty, en you are peine, not taking away the accused humanity, but you are accusée, giving it back, mais vous lui son humanité, back to the victims vous rendrez, of S21. Vous rendrez plutôt leur humanité aux victimes de that S21. concludes the prosecution's final statement. Je vais terminer avec mon réquisitoire, Monsieur le Président. The President, uh, the floor will be then given to the Defense Council to make uh, their oral closing statement. However, since it is now an appropriate time to take an adjournment and we do not wish to interrupt uh, mid of uh, their submission, so it would be appropriate to take the adjournment for 20 minutes. The session will be resumed by 20 to 11.